My name is Lisa Feldman. I am very delighted to be here to have a discussion with you about millennials and millennial careers at UC Berkeley. Um, and I'm here presenting with my colleague, Wilmer Castro. Good morning. Welcome, guys, to the NOT Conference. I'm glad you guys are here. Uh, so welcome to the NOT Conference. Uh, my name is Wilmer Castro, and I am a proud Cal millennial. Um, I currently, Woo! yeah, seriously. <laughs> How many of us are here in the audience, first of all? Great, glad to see you guys here. Glad to see you guys made it. Um, my name is Wilmer Castro. I work with the Talent and Organizational Performance Unit. Um, and today, we hope to have an engaging discussion, so please feel free to interject, ask questions, give your opinion. We're really kind of giving, hoping you guys give us some feedback and engage in a discussion. And uh, the, we want to give a quick overview of kind of what the topics that we're going to go about today in the conference, in this session. I have not to use this. Yeah, we'll go over to the... OK, I'll do it this way, there and go. then All right, so what we'll start off is kind of giving you guys a general overview of the various different generations here on campus to kind of give you a sense of what are the different generations here, and what are some of their trends and it's common trends to kind of deal with them in, in this workplace. And also, we're going to be dealing, talking about the forces facing UC Berkeley as an employer. So kind of some of the things, and what are the things that are driving the initiatives and the different uh, topics that the university and goals are having. So then we're going to talk about how to kind of develop a coaching relationship with your manager, and also how to build a development plan by using feedback from your peers and your manager. So at this time, I'll pass it over to Lisa. Sure, thank you. So um, it's great to see you all here. As background on me, I've been at Berkeley for almost 13 years, and I have been primarily in the student services side. Uh, in career services. So I'm very excited about this conference because I love helping people with their careers. Over my time here, I have seen the shift from our students being Gen X to our students being millennial. And in the process, I've really made it a point to learn about the needs of millennials. I've learned about millennial students, and I've also learned as a manager about millennial staff. So, um, I'm, so I'm sharing some of that perspective. Where I'm going to go now is to some generalizations. I want us all to have an understanding of what the, gener what the generations are and kind of the perspective that each of them has. And these are going to be gross generalizations because we're all unique. But I do want us all to have that groundwork. But before I do, I want to make sure that we lay on the table when people talk about millennials, and that's the you I'm talking about here. We know people say things about millennials. Can, can we all sort of share, can people sort of raise their hand and share some of the things that you hear said about this generation? Not committed to your job. Not committed to your job. Selfish. Selfish. Let's do hands, because I don't know where you're coming from here. Yes. Attention seeking. Attention -seeking. Selfish, not committed to your job. Inexperienced. Inexperienced. Oh, over there. Lazy. Lazy. That's a big one. <gasps> Betsy. Need, direction. Need lots of direction. Ask lots of questions. Yes. Plugged in, is that good or bad? Um, sometimes people think, sometimes right, right, exactly. Yes. Entitlement. Entitlement, expecting things. Over here. Too coddled. Too coddled by their parents. Yep. Sorry, then there's the light. Global view. Global view. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? thing. Good thing, we're saying a good thing. OK, excellent. Um, let's do, anybody have one more? So. Yes. Right. Team oriented. Good. I'm glad we ended on a good note. I'm going to start with the bad stuff because you all, one, one thing I want to say about the millennial generation is this generation is actually really aware of what other people are saying about you. So, um, so thank you for sharing that. Here's some other things that I've heard. Some of them are things you've said. Some of them are other things. Um, your parents are too involved, right? Too coddled. Always plugged in and multitasking, which is not considered a good thing sometimes by other people. Uh, act, act entitled. Oh, I got a bunch of these. Don't want to work the hours, the hours we need them to work. Lazy. Get bored easily. Need lots of stimulation. Ask too many questions about how to do things. Need lots of guidance. Can't spell. <laughs> <laughs> need lots of feedback and praise. What is this feedback thing? Um, I don't know what, where that popped up, but I'm sure you saw it. Too many questions. OK, so I wanted to lay that groundwork and really say I love millennials. I think millennials are ch will help us fix the problems in this world. And 
as some of the good things came out, I want to share other things that I feel are actually benefits of this generation. Um, millennials make us better managers. The question you ask your managers, the questions you have asked me, are all things that challenge me to actually manage you better and manage all of my people better. Um, flat organizations, being too casual, talking to the CEO, that can be an accusation. It's also the way organizations are going. Organizations are getting rid of layers of hierarchy. Um, you will improve how business gets done. Your brains are wired in a way I don't understand and we need to value. Um, you do understand privacy. There is an accusation like you do Facebook too much. Um, but I think this generation's really figured out nothing's private and yet we do have to think about what we put online. Um, you will get us out of the mess we created and you will take us to a future we cannot even imagine. And that's why I'm committed to doing workshops like this because I want to make sure millennials can be as successful as possible. So I'm going to quickly go through um, the generations so that you can understand, so we all can understand, because there was more than one generation in the room, um, where we all come from. Here's a list of generations. I'm not gonna, you can, we're going to go through them in a little more detail. What I want to say about this, though, is this is primarily an American generation list. This is American-centric. It is also socioeconomically narrow. Um, so when we do some of these generalizations about generations, we are actually not generalizing globally until you get to millennials. Because of technology, we are seeing millennial behavior around the world and in multiple socioeconomic statuses. Um, as I said at the bottom, each generation does expect everyone else before, after them to be just like them. How come things were so much better when we, were, when, when we did it, and you are such a disappointment. And the Gen Zs are going to be such a disappointment to you. So we can all, we all blame uh, the generations after us. To quickly run through this, um, and this is really laying the groundwork for our discussion about your careers. Is that a question? Yes. Um, what is the dual economic? Uh, sort of middle class, middle upper class, access to technology. Talk more slowly. Repeat the question. Um, what, what, um, <laughs> what class was it was the question. Um, and it is sort of generally middle class. People who have access to capital and jobs, for example, Here's the silent generation. You'll see it also called the traditional generation. The image there is the SC Johnson building in Racine, Wisconsin, designed, I think, by Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, this building is still being used. This is an old photo. They still work there. Look at the little people. Look at the big organization. This, isn't genera this is a generation that thinks of itself as part of something bigger. Um, it is very respectful of authority and of dedicating yourself to those bigger entities that are going to take really good care of them. This is a generation that experienced entities, larger organizations and the government taking good care of them um, and also fought for this country. Um, and their motivation is actually, let's keep everybody secure. Let's make sure we have stability. Um, baby boomers, some people might recognize this image. This is a Coke commercial. I'd like to teach the world to sing. M many different people of somewhat different colors on um, on a mountaintop singing about creating peace and drinking Coke. Um, this is a consumerist generation that is also about civil rights. It's, a, it's, it's an idealistic generation. It's the generation that brought us civil rights, the women's movement. Um, and they're also the biggest users of Facebook. Um, they are not afraid to change, but they also work very hard and want signs of success. Does this resonate with anybody? And as I list this, please think, who do you work with who might be coming from this perspective? Because it helps you understand maybe some of the friction you might experience with your different expectations. Gen X, OK, you recognize Ferris Bueller. Classic Gen X. I'm going to do it my own way. Forget school. I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to have fun. And I'm going to be so successful despite the, the external structures around me. Um, going it alone, entrepreneurial, um, the, 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 the um, tech boom, the tech bubble of the late 2000s, that was them. Um, and this is a group that really likes to get it done. And they tend to be t fairly financially oriented that way. And now millennials. OK, so we don't even have a single image for them because it, there's just so much going on. All the social media, it's a very social group, highly influenced by their parents. This is where the feedback piece comes in. This is a group that's used to getting lots of positive feedback and praise. Um, 
This obviously, um, you are digital natives, um, which means you know how to handle abundant, unorganized knowledge, which I think is an incredible benefit because that's the world we live in. And many of us don't know how to handle that. Um, and things I really share when I talk to especially other managers. Millennials, for millennials, time is valuable. You know someone else has already figured this out. You know you can Google it and get the answer. So why not get things done more quickly and move on to the next thing you can do? And that's one reason millennials ask a lot of questions. It's because they're trying to figure out, how do I get this done even more quickly? And this is an idealistic generation. Does it fit with my goals? I love that millennials are idealistic because we've got a lot we need to fix. All right, quick overview of generations. And now I'm going to pass it on to Wilmer to talk about, here we have these generations. What's going on at UC Berkeley, and what's your career like no matter what? Yeah, there so, you go. And it's that clicker to appreciate advance. Appreciate it. Thank you. So now that we have a better understanding of kind of the various multi-generational workforce we work in, it's good to kind of really start thinking about, OK, how can I develop myself <laughs> and align my goals with some of the initiatives and goals of the university? Um, I've been here for, over, for a little over a year and a half. And one of the things that really motivates me to kind of continue to develop myself here and to become an intricate part of the university has been really understanding the mission and the initiatives of the university. So I kind of want to start off by kind of giving you guys a picture of where the university is heading. And we have to start off by kind of a big constraint that not only UC Berkeley is facing, but public universities as a whole, especially those without a medical school. And if you, in this illustration here, we're showing the academic years 2002 to 2003 compared to 2012 to 2013. And these are the changes in funding structures. And one of the biggest things that kind of pops out here is the lack of state support and kind of funding from the federal government, which has, rev which has revved up the other initiatives to try to fill those gaps. Meaning, so we're working a lot more on, on a lot more philanthropic, philanthropic efforts and really engaging alumni to kind of participate and donate a lot more to kind of fill these gaps. Another segment you'll see a big change is in the student fees. So the university is also trying to kind of justify these fees by creating more services for students to make sure that we are developing high potential individuals and keep the status of an excellent university, world-renowned university. Um, along with the research funding, you guys have all probably heard about the global campus that's coming to Richmond, and that's all in efforts to kind of rev up and gather more research funding to fill these gaps. So it's good to understand some of these changing structures and funding to kind of really get a sense of what are some of the emerging careers, emerging departments. Um, and some sessions today, they'll be going over what, is, what, are the, what exactly are those departments and uh, what are those emerging careers that are happening on campus based on these changes. Another thing that we have to talk about, and this is probably one of the most things that makes me the proudest about working here at the university. UCB has really been a catalyst for social mobility. And what we, say, what we mean by that is, if you check out the blue um, bar here that represents Berkeley, these are the individuals who receive Pell Grant awards and graduate from Berkeley, meaning students that come from low-income backgrounds. And if you compare it to all these Ivy League schools together, you see the impact that Berkeley has on this population. And that's really powerful. That really speaks volumes. And, 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 and it makes me want to get engaged and get involved to see how can I really be a part of this, of this social catalyst mobility. And then a big part of what the university is trying to do is also understand that we want to keep an excellent status, world-renowned status as a university, but also maintain access to these students. So if you look at the graph here, you'll, you'll, you'll see Berkeley at the very affordable range compared to all these other Ivy Leagues. And that's an awesome thing that the university really wants to maintain access for these individuals. <clears throat> Another thing we'll go over too is kind of the workforce here. So this is UCB staff by generations, and this was provided by Cal Answers as, as of last year. The red here is the uh, baby boomer population, over about over 3,000. And then we're gonna go look at the uh, millennials, over a little bit over 2,000, and this is, they're growing as well. Um, and one thing to consider when you look at something like this is also kind of understand that within the next three to five years, we're probably going to be facing a large retirement rate. So that creates a huge opportunity for us millennials and Generation Xers. So it's important to really understand that we're moving towards a more high-performance culture and also how can we play a part of that, right? 
how can we kind of gauge and get feedback from these individuals who are transitioning into retirement? How do we capture that knowledge and leverage it to become an intricate part of your unit and a university? So this, these, all these facts are kind of just giving you a better picture as to how to align your development plan and your goals with the goals of the university. And we'll go over more in detail on kind of how to use feedback to do that. Great. That's fine. Um, all right, so now we're going to, now we've laid the groundwork. We've talked about generations, we've talked about what it's like at UC Berkeley. And now we're gonna talk more about your career. And um, as we, uh, the Berkeley is thinking very hard about how to better develop its staff careers, which is why we have the NOW Conference. Um, and this is a picture of your career at UC Berkeley or in your life. This is not specific to UC Berkeley, but this is something that we are talking about very actively now. The, the baby boomers and the silent generation all thought of careers as a ladder that you climb. And that metaphor is still in existence when we think about careers, that you want to get promoted and promoted and promoted, and then you're the big boss. And you get the big corner office. That's the baby boomer model. Um, really, the model of today is that a career has many different dimensions. So this is a lattice, if I didn't say that word yet. This is a career lattice rather than a career ladder. Um, your career can move up, sideways, down, however you want. And when we talk about how we're coaching managers about developing careers, we're also making sure that here at Berkeley, managers aren't thinking, because many of them come from the latter perspective, that what you do with a good staff member is you promote, 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 or you get promoted, promoted, promoted. You can develop in several ways in your job. You can start a job and get better at those skills because those are skills you need. You can invest in getting better at your job. You also can look at ways that you can expand your job, staying in that same job, and getting, getting good at those skills and then gaining more skills. And you can consider your job as a stepping stone, as something where you want to figure out how to build on that and move to the next job. And those, those three ways of thinking about your career, once again, are not unique to UC Berkeley. That is how you should think about your career. When you are in any job, think about the skills that you're learning, the skills that, the skills that you're getting better at that you have, the skills that you're learning, and how you want to build on that. So, I, and I do want to emphasize, managers are being trained, even in this conference, on how to think about developing your career this way. At the same time, in any organization, and in some ways, especially at UC Berkeley, there is a lot of process. We managers are not just thinking, not just developing people, but we've got rules. And I have to say, these rules are in place at Berkeley even more than elsewhere, I think, probably because we're a public institution and this is something we, we care about. They're there for fairness. They're there to make sure that people who, uh, actually, that that success is documented and that we build on reality and that we help real people in an equitable way. And things that you come across as you develop your career here are things like your job description. You actually do need to know what you're supposed to do. You do need to have expectations and goals set with your manager. And these are real things that you got to get done and you got to focus on. There are also constraints that your manager has. Your manager just can't rearrange things because we document this to make sure it's fair. Um, you have your title, your, your working title, um, and there are all sorts of ways to, to move around with that. Working titles can change, um, but then we, say, then we hear people who want promotions. And promotion is really not a, a really useful word here, and I want to make sure people understand that. Um, what we can do with people is sometimes we can reclassify them. We've got Career Compass, which is a fabulous program to help you understand the different levels you're at. And we can look at the next level up. To reclassify someone who's very good is very challenging and takes months and lots of paperwork and budget. So I want you to understand that if you want to move up just in your, in your one level, it's actually fairly challenging. And there's all sorts of equity things that come into play because we're making sure things are fair. So as you're thinking about, I want more, don't jump to, I want a promotion or reclassification. Think about the different options, because you'll actually have more flexibility if you work directly with your manager on building your skills. That said, I want you to, under, I want you to understand this word if you hadn't heard it before. 
Um, and I do want to emphasize, you know, paying people more, developing people costs the university money. Many, most of us have this sort of 5%, you know, development in our, uh, t in our, in our job descriptions, which we're using, we're consuming today. Um, but if you want to go to a conference, if you want to be developed in some way, that does cost money. And once again, it's a challenge for managers sometimes because in the interest of fairness, you could say, I want to go to this conference, it costs $700, or I want to take this class and it costs $300. And they need to make sure that they're not just helping you, but they're helping all their staff. So I, as a manager and as someone who, you know, because you will become managers and because you will be working with your managers on your career, I wanted you to understand that there are rules at Berkeley and I, there are a lot more than this and I'm glad to, answer those questions, but those are really boring. Um, but that there are processes and logistics here on campus as you think about, and as managers think about, how do you develop an individual? All right. We've been talking for a long time. So I'm going to say one more thing, and then we're going to talk to each other. Um, we're going to do an exercise. Basically, the future of, yeah, every, Stress level in the room went up, right? The future of, future of the workplace is that we have to work with our managers on our development. What skills do we have that we want to get better at? What skills do we want to learn? What is our next step? And the way you do that is, as we said in the title of this, develop a coaching relationship with your manager. You can't wait for your manager to come to you. And many people do. I know I have. You're, the thing that we all have, every single one of us in every organization, is the right of first conversation, the right to actually approach our managers and say, I want to talk to you about my development. So if you don't feel like you've gotten that from your manager, make an appointment, set it up, and say, let's talk about my development. And this is something in every job and at every stage of your career you should do. You should be aware of this, and you should be having these conversations. What I'd like you to do now is, oh, before I say that, I also want to say, your manager needs things from you, too. You are really talented. You're hired here because you're really talented. And millennials have all these unique talents. As you go into this conversation, you have power as well because your manager wants you to perform well and wants you to use your skills because they hired you for these skills, if not more than these skills. So sometimes there can be some anxiety about starting this, and I want to say you have a lot to offer your manager, and thinking about your manager's needs and what you can offer is a key piece of this conversation. So it's a really simple exercise in a way, but I actually want you to take a minute and think about or write down what you're trying to get out of your current job. Are you try what skills are you building on? Do you want to get better at? What skills do you want to learn? Or how is this a platform for the future? Take a minute and think about that. And then I want to do a role play. I want you to turn to the person next to you. We'll take a few minutes. And I want you to actually try having a conversation. Pretend that person's your manager and have that conversation and say, hi, I wanted to let you know I'm really excited about this job. I love being part of this team and I want to talk a bit about my skills. And then actually say out loud, because this is the really hard part, out loud's the hardest, um, what, is, what is it that you want to get out of your job? Give that a try. I want the second person to give feedback on that. How did it sound? Did it sound me, me, me? Did it sound we're interested in, in benefiting the whole team? Is there a better way to say it? And then I want you to switch places. So we're going to do it. We're going to take, I'm going to give you like 30 more seconds because I know you've been thinking while I'm talking. Um, and then turn to each other. And I'll call after about three minutes. I'll call a break and you can switch. All right? Go. <laughs> so three things just happened. Three things just happened. One is you talked. The other is you gave feedback. I also wanted to make sure, since millennials love feedback, that we had opportunities for people to give each other feedback in this session. So I hope you, uh, you got some good feedback and gave some good feedback. And the third is you got to feel like what it was like to hear the question. And I have to say, as a manager, when someone approaches you to have this conversation, it's sometimes challenging for us. 
because we really want to help you. And we're using all of the tools we have to develop you. And I know Berkeley is giving us even more tools. Um, but it, it is, it, it, it's, in, in, I, so I'm interested in hearing just a little bit of feedback on each thing. Did anybody feel like they heard sort of a, a way of this was expressed that was particularly good? Or any comments on what you heard? Yes. Uh, my partner's tone was really calming. So your partner's tone was calming. OK, so she said we. She was teamwork oriented, so you didn't feel threatened or overwhelmed. Great. Any other things? Yes. Oh, good. And we're passing around a mic, so I don't even have to repeat what you're saying. OK, sorry. So when I was the supervisor, um, my partner came to me in a, in a really great way because she said it in a way that said, I deserve to have this conversation with you, and I deserve to be developed, but also wasn't forceful and like, you need to tell me how this is going to go because she understood that I have resource constraints too as her supervisor and I may not be able to make promises beyond whatever we've talked about in the next year. And so I thought that the tone she struck was really helpful because it said that she deserves something in this conversation as a professional, but it wasn't putting me on the spot as someone who may not be able to make some of those higher decisions. Great. Good. Thank you. Other comments on this experience and what you heard? Yes, over here. Oh, we've got two mics. Um, what I thought was really helpful was Lashante was able, when I asked her questions of how she thought she might go about developing the skills, that she had concrete answers. So when we were talking about, she was interested in, in learning more about analytical skills around disbursements, I said, well, how do you think about doing that? Not leaving it up to me to tell her how to do it, but she came to me with the ideas of how to do it herself. And I'll, all I would have to say is, that sounds great. Let's make it happen. Great. Fantastic. Thank you. Anything else people want to share? OK, well, we're going to have lots of time for Q&A at the end. So if other questions come up as a result of this, um, we can address them. But I hope this also was a first step in getting you some practice in, in asking these kinds of questions and thinking about your skills and how to build on them. Oh, that was, the, that was what I was going to put up during the exercise, a little experiment thing. All right. So what we want to get into now is um, kind of how to create and how to develop this um, development plan, right? And I was telling Lisa, you know, how awesome it is that we're actually in this room, um, and you guys are probably enjoying these really comfortable seats. So this is where the football team comes to kind of view the plays and strategize. So it just, it's pretty, it just hit me that this is pretty awesome and it resonates to what we're kind of trying to initiate here to do. So in doing so and in trying to think about your development plan, right, there's not a one size fit all. So there's just kind of things that you should consider when you kind of start strategizing your goals here on campus. And one of the things we've done to help you kind of do that is kind of how to use your feedback to gauge development. So what we try to do is break it down into three simple steps, you know. First, a self-assessment, then the execution plan, and then the process of evaluating this with yourself and your managers. Um, so we're going to start off with a self-assessment, right? How do you actually create this development plan? Um, and what we talked about before, the, you know, this job description, uh, this piece of paper that kind of dictates where your time should be spent. And you want to really kind of assess that job description and really identify what are the main priorities that your supervisors and managers have identified that you should really focus on. Because you all know it's pretty a very long list of things, and sometimes you just might spend more time on one thing than others. So really assessing what those major chunks of time that you're spending the most of your time in at work and really kind of writing that down to discuss it with your manager so that they know if there are conflicting priorities, right? So for example, if the manager is telling you that one is a priority but you're really spending your time in a different task, you might really kind of want to engage them in that conversation so that they're aware. Um, another thing you might want to do is, you know, start thinking about what are the skills that you need to leverage versus the skills that you need to develop. And you want to do that by really initiating 360 degree feedback. And this, everyone here kind of have heard of this term before, so it's really kind of turning to your colleagues, your managers, and your clients, your various different clients here on campus, to kind of really ask these constructive questions that generate and help you plan out this development plan. So you want to ask hard questions like, you know, what can I do better? Or what do you like? Or what are some things that I need to improve that you see that I need to either gain more skill on or really kind of shadow someone else to kind of get better at? Um, <clears throat> another thing is, too, you want to start 
mapping out and seeing what kind of learning opportunities here on campus you are really interested in that'll help you kind of match with those feedbacks that you're receiving. And what we did today, um, just in the hopes of being sustainable and not printing out a thousand copies of material for you to just kind of lose around on your desk, we created a digital packet for you so that you can log into what's now called the Wisdom Cafe, a brand new website here, where you can go on there and there's a Google file for you with templates and also different resources to kind of help you understand the initiatives and goals of the campus along with kind of how to do self-assessments. And it's actually a really nice template where you can continuously use this and not just have one piece of paper. Um, <clears throat> and also, keeping your manager involved in this discussion. You want to make sure that you have buy-in from your supervisors and managers to make sure that they understand and they're on board with the type of development that you might need or you, that you're interested in. <clears throat> so, then you want to actually map this out, map out your learning experience. Has anyone here heard of the term 70-20-10 rule? Do you, anybody want to elaborate on that? Kathy, let me, uh, you want to talk a little bit about that? Or <laughs> is that okay? Let me see your feedback, your, op your, your opinions. Let's hope I don't screw it up. Okay, so um, the idea is that we learn um, only 10% of what we learn at work, we learn in a formalized classroom situation. So someone like me who does training and development, I'm really only helping about 10% of all the knowledge that you need to have, right? Yeah, right? Okay. So does that help? Yeah, and that's, a, okay. that's actually a really big part of it, that a lot of people here on campus kind of have down packed. You know, they actually, they, they see and they assess the development need, they automatically throw training at it. So what the 70-20-10 rule does is kind of help you go and think about the more effective ways of thinking about development. So it talks about 70% of learning experiences should really be on-the-job experimental activities. And what that means is, you know, activities like role shadowing. And also a very uncommon one is workflow shadowing. And what that is is not just shadowing an individual that has, that's doing a task that you might be in charge of, but it's also following the process to its entirety. So I'll give you an example. Um, I had to train for a uh, program that I, was had, I had to uh, manage a little bit for, it's called the tuition, Reduced Tuition Fee Program. Has anybody heard of that opportunity here for career development? Great. So yeah, this is a, the applications are open, by the way. So if you are a matriculated student here and you need a reduction in fees, apply. So basically, what, it, what I tried to do was to understand the process in its entirety. I not only role shadowed with the individual that, that I was picking that task up from, I tried to team up with the different handoffs in this process. So I went to the student, um, <clears throat> the student payment services. I contacted the person who I hand off this, this application to to kind of assess what does he do with the forms and what does he do and what would he prefer and what would make things easier for him in the transition. So that way I can kind of really assess where I can input different um, effective ways on how to make the process more effective or simplified in any way. So kind of thinking about the process as a whole and seeing the different people involved in there and kind of what are their inputs on the process helps you go back to your manager and really discuss on possible opportunities on how to simplify a process. So, you know, it's a very uncommon thing that we don't do here, so I really kind of hope that you guys Think about some of these processes that you're involved in, because there's a lot here on campus. So think a lot, a lot about those. And then there's also special assignments that you can ask for and seek from your managers and supervisors, along with getting involved with affinity groups on campus. You know, one of the things I really enjoy doing is uh, being a part of the Black Staff Orgs and really kind of involving myself in there and trying to volunteer the best I can. Also, the next part is 20% of some of your learning experiences should be based off relationship and continuous feedback, which is kind of one of our things that we always seek as millennials, and kind of how to use that to really start developing yourself. And some of the things on campus to help you meet those, that 20% is being involved in communities of practice, the various different staff boards, also seeking mentorships from other colleagues, and gauging more coaching experiences and coaching relationships with not just managers and supervisors, but also other individuals and in departments and in positions that you find interesting or that you have as a goal. So there's definitely a lot of different programs here that are also outlined in this digital packet that we'll go over in a little bit so that you can start kind of seeing and map out some of these different learning initiatives here on campus so you can go follow those. Um, <clears throat> and then we talked about the 10% rule, which we have that down pack here, and 
There's also a great list of resources and learning resources on this digital packet that we'll go over to hit that 10%. The next part is kind of evaluation process, right? So preparing for your formal review and kind of keeping in mind that, you know, your performance review here on campus, um, some, some people I heard have never had one. So kind of really kind of taking control of this very mysterious and scary process and how to take control of it and how to use it to leverage your development plan. So, you know, one of the things you really want to do, and we talked about it earlier in establishing a coaching relationship with your manor, manager, you want to really schedule these learning reflection conversations with your manager. Put it on your calendar. You know, we're all really familiar with BCAL. Have a set place and set time where you can really kind of talk in a formal manner with your manager and supervisors on some of the things that you're learning, especially if you're, you know, if you're getting involved with these workflow process shadowing and you start realizing simplifications. So these are the, the, the venues that would give you the opportunity to give those ideas out and, and, and get them met by your managers, hopefully, with some buy-in. And also, start um, writing out your accomplishments. One of the tasks, uh, one of the um, objects I use to do this is uh, the Google task options. Have you guys seen that option in your Gmail? It's a great facet to use. Uh, it, what it allows you to do is any kind of tasks that come in or acknowledgements or anything like that, it lets you save them in this task list. I actually try to type that out and, and simplify that at the end of the, my year around this time to kind of see, okay, what have I accomplished? What big things here that I was told to do have I done and I'm very proud of and, and it can speak volumes on my formal review. So it's a great tool to use and I really kind of recommend it. It's called the Google Task Option. Um, another thing you want to do is also start identifying colleagues to include in feedback for your formal review. Not many people know you could do this, but if you're working with specific clients on a regular basis and you would like their input on your formal review, you're free to do that. So start identifying some of these clients and some of your colleagues that you're working with on a daily basis to be involved in this formal review. And also kind of keeping in mind on the evaluation process and its, and its uh, timeline. Uh, know that it's always around October, so July in the summertime, you should really start kind of building up some of those learning opportunities that you want, some of those goals you have, and really start preparing for this process and this formal review. Any questions about that by any chance, or feedback on that? All right, and we'll go over in more in uh, the question and answers and over some of the uh, resources we want to outline for you. Um, this is called an individual development plan, which Kind of a, a lot of the managers on campus are being coached on how to use this to start setting goals for not just the individuals in their team, but the individuals in their team, but also to kind of start matching it with the goals of the of the unit as well. So this is also on the digital packet that we've created for you on the Wisdom Cafe. So you could use it as a template continuously and start developing yourselves and writing down your goals. And this is a picture of kind of where, how, how this Wisdom Cafe looks. And it's uh, for all Berkeley staff. And you could just type it in on the, uh, on the Google, on your Berkeley homepage and type in Wisdom Cafe. And all you have to do is really kind of search for our session. And our session is easily identifiable. It's a Cal Millennials as a hashtag. You can search this hashtag on the Wisdom Cafe. And it'll give you the, the blog post that's, that contains the Google file with all these resources that we've outlined for you, okay? So we wanna open this time now to kinda get some feedback or if you have any questions about kinda some of the things we went over as far as using feedback or any of the generational differences, please feel free to kinda participate and, and ask any questions or any feedback you might have. No? Yeah, let me get the mic to you. Electronic copy of? Yeah, also at the end of the session, if you go on to the, um, the Now Conference website, a lot of these sessions are recorded and you'll be able to find the digital copies of this as well and make sure that it's on there. Um, and also our contacts will be on the blog post of you. Feel free to keep in contact with me or Lisa. Yes, Joel. Can you talk a little bit uh, about? Sorry. Can you talk a little bit about the um, communities of practice we have on campus and how to get involved with that, um, so on? Great, great. So we actually, I thought we had a very awesome representative for that up here, but I think she might have stepped out. But so the communities of practice here on campus, in the, in the um, Wisdom Cafe, you'll notice in the digital packet we created for you, there's a list of all the various different communities of practice. Um, and 
what you could do is kind of volunteer for yourself in these various different committees that emphasize on the different goals that these communities of practice might have. So they range from, if you can help me out with some examples of good ones, um, I'm trying to think back of... You mean the business process and yeah, analysis BPI. working group? Yeah, yeah, and, and actually that's one to, that's very, a good one that's to highlight, group. the BPI, yes. the business process improvement. If you go on to the LMS on camp, uh, here at, on the website, on the, on the internet, you'll be able to find some of the BPI 101 classes that are um, hosted by Dahlia Clark, who's also in our, my team with Talent Organizational Performance, which kind of overviews how to uh, analyze processes and how to suggest simplification and really map these things out. Really awesome uh, class I recommend. And there's various different ones. There's BPOG, uh, and there's also uh, Berkeley's Facilitators Network. I'm also a part of that one. That's a really good one. Can. What does CAN stand for? Yeah. Cal Assessment Network. Social Learning Community of Practice. There's also a relatively new uh, Berkeley Women's Circle, Lean In Circle. The Cal Women's Lean In Circle. Yeah. So there's very various ones that kind of really feed some of the different goals you might have and initiatives that you might want to start up here on campus. And I, I want to add, because I am part of these groups, um, as I have looked at my career over time here, I have made amazing contacts for networking. I know there's sessions on networking and informational interviewing. It's so great to get outside of your usual crowd, your usual office, and go to one of these meetings and hear the amazing things that are happening on campus and meeting people who are doing them, because you can also start to envision new goals for yourself as a result. Let's try to get it. Like yeah, we're gonna. We've got. No, I, but we do want to have a mic for you so we can record your voice. I'll try to get to you. Sorry, so this is for the recordings. Here you go. Um, I made eye contact with Lisa, so I now <laughs> have to say it. Um, I met Lisa at one of the groups, and it was easier to network on campus because I needed something. I didn't say, Lisa, I need something. I just said, overwhelmed, I need this, this, and that, and Lisa immediately said, I have it. Um, so I encourage people to go to those groups, because um, you meet people that want to help each other. That's awesome, thank you. And two rows back. Uh, hi, my name is Judy. Uh, thank you for explaining millennials. I'm just curious, what's the difference or the similar similarities between Gen Z? So, um, so it's interesting, and uh, I'm not going to flip all the way back, but if the first big difference is the numbers. Millennials is a ma are a massive generation, gen with about 92 million. Gen Z is forecasted to be about 60 million. Um, so just, if you just take the macro view, think about how the world's going to change when there's wealth in the 92 million, because we're always building more wealth, and it only goes to 60 million. And what's going to happen to our infrastructure when we actually have fewer people applying to college because the numbers drop so much. So that's one. What we're finding is, and, and you know, this whole generational gener generalizations um, is fairly new um, and fairly recent. One thing we're seeing is they almost kind of, over, they kind of sort of alternate. So millennials and baby boomers are the idealistic generations. What we're finding is Gen Z, which is now, they're now about, the oldest ones are about 13, are really entrepreneurial. They're really, they're less programmed than the, than the millennials. The millennials are the stressed out generation that had to like, every second of their day was programmed. That's been observed and now there's sort of a bit of a backing off on that programming and emphasis on creativity and free time. And I know my, my Facebook feed is always full of these stories about like the little kid who figured out that if you change the typeface on government documents, you can save like $80 billion, right? This is Gen Z. Gen Z is like looking at, is like really sort of entrepreneurial and figuring things out in a different way than millennials are. They're also digitally native differently than, because they grew up in a world with apps the way that millennials didn't quite do. So, but we are seeing a small, smaller generation that's extremely entrepreneurial. Oh, sorry, Mike. If you can connect the dots between the millennial preferences, I know they're generalizations to some degree, 
but uh, that and the role um, I could play in their career development. So what, what would I be looking, looking towards as a manager or a mentor to, to someone who is in, a, in the millennial category so to help them move forward that, that's meaningful and motivates them? Right. So what can a manager do that's meaningful for motivating millennials? So I'm not going to answer that question. I want a millennial to answer that question. So who wants to, who wants to, we can have a couple. Who wants to sort of toss something out? Well, I'll say one is that. Oh, there we go. Right, <laughs> the one with the mic. Go ahead. Um, I think one of the things that can be done is like when you, our, at least I say for my position specifically, my job description was a little vague and that was because no one had asked any questions, which is one of the things that millennials are known for is asking a lot of questions to do the job right the first time. And you can't always depend on the person that you hire to have the initiative to go about doing it. So I think before you hire, before you get into the process, you should ask yourself and whoever else that person is supposed to support or just whatever they do, what do you actually need? And then put that down on paper because that'll be a better starting point rather than just bringing someone in that has skills to do something. Actually get the person that has the skills to do what you need done. That way there's no leeway in between and then that person has a clear idea of what their job is and what they're gonna do right. straight through. And may I just say, this is what I mean by millennials make us better managers. We've been writing vague job descriptions and now we've gotta actually write specific job descriptions. Um, I also want to sort of emphasize that the millennial generation, because it's been highly programmed, is still learning how to ask questions when there is ambiguity. And that's one reason I want to do exercises where you practice asking questions. That's one thing you can do. Um, something else is, is, oh, okay, yeah, go ahead. We can ask, have more answers. I just wanted to share some other ideas. Um, one is, um, uh, really helping them to get introduced to key people in um, your own department and also, you know, you, if you've been here for more than 10, 20 years, you have a ro Rolodex of people that, you know, if they could connect with them, because we're all about networking uh, online and offline as well. And so I think, you know, one thing I've really appreciated about my supervisor is that she introduces this introduces me to people, um, even when I've kind of forgotten about, you know, what I said, like, oh, I'm really interested in diversity. So she introduces me to someone who works on an initiative like that. A second piece is putting me in the seat of being an educator as well. I think oftentimes as a millennial, we're seen as being naive or inexperienced, but oftentimes we are also educated and we've done a lot of internships and we've worked on a lot of um, high level entrepreneurial projects in our college careers. And so I've taken on the role in my office in taking initiatives for transfer students or um, other things. And it's really helped, I think, gain the respect of my colleagues that have been here for a very long time, where now we are not just you know, with someone mentoring me, but I'm consulting with someone who's been here for 15, 20 years on maybe um, something I'm passionate about. And I also go to them for things. So it's very collaborative and um, putting me in the seat of an educator and a leader as well at an early start. Thank you. Yeah. And we have one more over here. Oh, Oh, sorry. We've got lots of answers to this, but I also want to, why don't we do one more and then we'll, if someone has a different question, we can go to that. And if not, we can just stay on this. Um, so I challenge supervisors and, and directors to um, let go of some of the things. So they try to do everything and seeing as how I can, I can catch things quickly or, you know, like she said, we're, we're, educated and we have a lot of ideas. So be able to let go of some of your projects and allow us to take full advantage, take advantage of the person that you have in the position. You hired someone that's educated and has all these ideas. So take advantage of that and allow us to do some more project management and actually let go of some things. I see a lot of supervisors like to hold everything, but they're all stressed out. So if you would just let go of some of the projects and allow us to be more hands-on and involved and collaborate with you, like she said, um, a lot more things might get done and you'll find that you're really taking advantage of the person that you actually hired. Great. Thank you. And I would add to that, we non-millennials can mistake all the questions millennials ask as sort of as naivete, but actually, we do have very experienced people who know, know how to do things and get things done. So don't mistake lots of questions for can't get stuff done because millennials are fabulous at jumping in and getting stuff done. Is there a different question or do we want to keep going on this discussion? How, if you have a different question, raise your hand. 
Oh, and then one back there. Okay, so we'll go to a couple different questions. So I have a question about identifying, finding out what our manager's constraints are given the campus initiatives, because I think <clears throat> even though my manager does a very good job of keeping us connected with, <clears throat> excuse me, the conversation that campus leadership has about the direction that the campus is going, um, they also have their workload and they're working within their constraints. So I want to come to them about my professional development goals, knowing about their constraints. So I'm not asking something that's completely, you know, unacceptable or unpredictable or something. Like I want to find the happy middle ground before I get to them without, so I don't get shot down basically. That's great. And that's very um, important to know what the context you're working in is. And is your question, how do you find that out? How do we find out about budget or other constraints? Now I'm going to ask a manager to ask, answer this question. I know there are a couple in the room. OK. <laughs> OK, maybe there was. There, yes, there's work. I can still remember more. I don't have like a great answer to this, but I mean, I just think like you come out and ask like maybe before you ask specifically what you're interested, you might just want to ask a general question like what did the budget look like this year and, and do we have any funding set aside for professional development? So just try to get a general idea and then I'll give you some idea of what might be available for you. Um, and then I'm going to talk about this more later, but I just want to refer people back to that 70-20-10 because you know, a lot of career development can be done without any money whatsoever, just in the form of stretch assignments and other things. So you just want to really have a broad mind when you're thinking about that as well. I would also add, you're not going to, probably not going to be the only person on your team who could benefit from this knowledge. So you could also, you know, ask your man, say to your manager, I'm really interested in learning more about the constraints you work in. You know, do you want to share it with me? Do you want to share it in one of our team meetings? I think we'd all be interested in learning. You could see if that's a, a model that they would be willing to do too. Can I raise my hand as a manager? Yes, another manager. <laughs> um, I was really struck by what you said about many people's um, development plan has five percent for their evaluation plan has five percent for development. I think um, millennials could really um, instigate a culture shift by asking when you're interviewing for new positions, ask what the department's resources and plans are for staff development to show that that's important to you and that you would be more interested in positions where they have defined a budget for staff development or they can tell you of examples of how de they're developing their staff. I think that could be really influential. I, I really kind of want to add to that because, you know, as a millennial, I think that's one of the key points that I, I always try to ask even in, in any possible job offers or interviews that to really kind of assess who will be in charge of my development, you know, or specific questions like, you know, is there a track of development for my position? And really assessing those uh, questions at the beginning of your, you know, job is really important. So that way they know that you're coming in with a plan to succeed and develop and move on from your original task that you're, um, that you're giving. I think, was there a question over there? No, oh, it was over, okay. Could either of you speak to your own personal experiences in implementing some of these skills or like career development practices in your own career trajectories or experience on campus or in other positions? Like what that's looked like, any highs and lows? Things like that, like our, our learning experiences from kind of implementing stuff in the presentation, like the more practical things. Sure, I, I've been on campus longer. <laughs> yeah. um, and I want to say that um, the individual development plan, here we can even go back to that. This, um, I've, I've experienced this and other versions of this um, over time here. Um, you'll also find on, in the packet a self assessment um, worksheet. And um, that is something that sort of was piloted where I was working on campus. Um, and it really is, um, it, that is an aspect of development that I have really appreciated. You know, we do do annual reviews. Um, for those of us who like feedback, which is like, who doesn't like feedback? But in particular, millennials, annual seems awfully, you know, an awfully long time between feedback, formal feedback sessions. Um, and 
um, thinking about how to use those kinds of plans on an ongoing basis, I think, is, is actually something that's sort of coming up now. So that's, that I'd I've used those. I like them, especially the self-assessment worksheet. I really like that. Um, and, uh, and, and I've built on that. Um, I, I have to say, I think, you know, if you think 70, 2010, the, the, the networking I have done through other groups has been the most powerful for me. To learn more, this is such a complicated place to work. To learn more and meet people, um, to me, that actually has probably been the biggest for my career here. I have, and and I've, I'm in my new role on the SIS project, actually, as a result of meeting someone through, um, through one of those activities. So I have to say, networking, meeting other people, it's the top thing you can do from my perspective. And, and I guess for myself, I, I think that, you know, it's pretty interesting. I've been here for about a year and six months. I came from New Jersey, um, and I started off in an admin role in the H central HR department, working with an awesome team in the learning department um, on campus here. And I think one of the biggest things that I guess has been the most useful, along with the self-assessment, to really kind of help me think and assess myself, that was like a pivotal thing for me to do, and, and I really recommend that to individuals. But really, in that resource packet that, that we, uh, we created for you all, there's some really cool reports and really kind of very strong reports that have been delivered by different executive leadership teams here on campus, they kind of give you an idea of where the direction of the university is going. And that was like my biggest um, part in this plan for me, was really assessing, okay, where's the university heading? And I see the constraints, financial constraints, the different uh, the departments that are growing and that are really intricate in the success of Berkeley. And how do I align myself to really make myself valuable to be either able to partake in those departments and, and be a part of those departments. So really kind of understanding what are the goals of your unit along with the university is, should be at least your second step after really assessing yourself and your, not, and your skills that you need to develop to perform the tasks that you're actually being given and also the ones that you kind of want to gain in the future. So that has spoken and done really awesome things for me because um, look, I'm an admin. I came from New Jersey about a year ago, and I was able to volunteer to different uh, initiatives on campus that I saw would be very impactful. And in volunteering, I was able to get noticed and very network with different individuals. And I'm happy to say, you know, in about a week, I'll start a new job with right along my career goals. Um, so, and, and I did that by self-assessing, really assessing where the, the university's heading and kind of aligning myself with that. add something. I'm actually Generation X um, with a little millennial um, <laughs> in me. Um, but I think um, what has helped me, I actually just recently got reclassified. Um, and the way I approached it was I actually looked at the job uh, family, the little matrix that we have, and a lot of people don't know uh, about this matrix. Um, and I looked at the description and what the job required. And so I actually approached my supervisor at the time and I said, listen, you know, this is the, the direction I want to go. These are my skill sets. This, these are what, you know, this is what I'm doing to uh, develop additional skill sets. And I want you to give me more. Simple, I didn't have anything in writing or anything. I just said, this is, this is what I want. And so my supervisor actually started putting me on these additional projects, having me use, I was like, you know, I have Excel skills that you guys don't even know that I have. Um, so he started putting me, challenging me, like, okay, I'm going to give you this. I want you to create this, this, this. And so it actually put me in a position when someone went out on leave. He said, you know what? I want you to take on that role. I said, okay. And I did it for like six, six weeks, okay. flying colors. And so because I was able to do that, he said, you know what? I want you to keep some of you know, the responsibilities. And so it was an easy transition for me to get reclassified. Um, so that just kind of right. just kind of wanted to add, you know, you go and you you look and I look to see this is where I want this is where I want to go. And it was, you know, concrete things that I needed to do. Um, and it kind of helped me to kind of move forward. And I've only been here three years. Great. Thank you. Yes. If you haven't um, looked at Career Compass and the different ways that we classify things in the different job families, it is a very useful way to think about how to you know, what buckets your career might fall into. We had a question way over there that I don't want to lose sight of. Hi, I, I am a millennial, and uh, my manager is a millennial, which is fantastic. However, when I work with other managers on projects who are not millennials, I feel like I'm not prepared for the pushback that I feel. So if you have any 
suggestions on how to kind of quickly make that switch because I may be working with the manager uh, for like six weeks and it's not enough time to sit down with this person and they're not my direct manager, but I don't want to, you know, have my millennial focus and like, well, my manager, she knows exactly what I'm talking about and now I need to adjust to this other manager for this separate project. So if you have any suggestions on how to, to uh, just have that in mind when I speak to other managers so that I'm not throwing them off. Has anyone else experienced this kind of thing or a change in managers and needing to connect with a manager? Because this, this goes beyond generations, actually. This has to go with yeah. style in lots of ways. Does anyone want to share their experience? My manager is here. OK. <laughs> so the pressure's on. The pressure's on. <laughs> anyone want to share an answer? I mean, oh, good, oh, good. Hi. Um, I, I was actually going to ask about being a millennial manager because there's a lot of my own challenges supervising people twice my age. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think as working with fellow managers who are in other, older generations than me, I think I have to observe. I know, Christian, we've talked about this, just observe how they work. And I think um, respect comes out a lot. And so if they see that through my action and through my words, I respect them for their experiences and hear them out bef without interrupting them or, you know, I think sometimes we're so working nonstop that we have to, sometimes we interrupt people by accident. So for me, I try to write things down as much as possible so they don't feel that I'm, per that they don't perceive me as disrespecting them. So for my own experiences, and I'm still learning this, respect is key. <laughs> um, and I think really listening and asking the questions, but being thoughtful with your questions. I think some of us tend to ask questions before thinking it through. So if I kind of have done my own research or thought something through, then I'll, I'll say, well, based on this thing I read, this is why I'm asking these questions. Is that another comment on this? No, behind you. Um, I'm someone of practicality, so uh, one practical tip that I've been reading a lot about is the language that we use and how we present ourselves. Um, and, and I heard that I read this article that women, we tend to use the word just a lot, even millennials. I, I, I believe it was millennials, I, I apologize. Where when we write... It's actually in, all women, yeah, any age. Yeah, we write, we write oh, just, you know, I'm, I'm just checking in. Or, you know, so I realize even in my language, I would say about 80% of my job is through email with students, with my colleagues, with people above me, people that, maybe even students that I work with, and I realize the language that I use, just as much as what I wear, how I say things, uh, really either gains the respect of people or really turns them off in a bad way. And I know a lot of us use our um, phones for email, um, and it, you know, there's that, that line, oh, it's sent from my iPhone. I don't think that that's forgivable when you have maybe an error, like a spelling error or the language that we use, you know, um, I, I know I'm being very extreme, but that's just a practical tip in, in working with, um, I believe people that, you know, really care about that communication is presenting ourselves in a way um, that is respectable and look, looking at the language that we use. If you look back at your emails, I, I can guarantee, at least when I looked at mine, I, I counted the times I used just in just one week, and it was a lot. <laughs> so I just wanted to share that information that I learned. Yeah, I think I want to add one more thing. You know, one thing that I try to do as well is uh, I remember reading Stephen Covey back like my freshman year of college, and one of the principles that really kind of stuck to me, stuck with me, was uh, you know, seek first to understand rather than to be understood. So focusing on trying to be heard and get your getting your point across, I think it's very important to kind of really understand and assess the individuals you're working with, not just their generations, but just their styles, and kind of getting a better sense of what it is that they might have or what situations they're involved in to kind of before you project what your needs are and what your op opinions are. So that, that has helped me a lot and I, I highly recommend, you know, seeking first to understand rather than to be understood. And I think we are out of time. Thank you guys so Thank much for coming to our session. Great. I hope you enjoyed the session.